All right. I've got one important word written on my notes here, and that is lunch. Nah. So we're between you and lunch, so I apologize if your stomachs are starting to rumble. Um, I have with me Dr. Dan Bonet, who is professor of computer science in the Applied Cryptography Group at Stanford University. And you've also started a center for blockchain research, so we're going to talk about that, um, because that's something I'm mildly suspicious about. But I hear Stanford's a good university, so it's probably something in it. Um, but before we get started, on that sort of blockchain-y kind of side of things, when I was growing up, the word hacker meant someone who did something, and then it we did something with computers or electronics or things, and it veered into being someone who breaks into things, and it sort of slightly reclaimed its place. But we need to talk about the word crypto, right? So what's happened to the word crypto? Yeah, that's actually a pretty interesting. So the word crypto, I hope in this audience, means cryptography. Cryptography is the science of protecting information uh, and more. Uh, and uh, the word crypto has morphed in the last couple of years to also mean cryptocurrencies. And these days, when you use the word crypto, there's a bit of confusion. Is it cryptography? Is it cryptocurrencies? So I want to set the record straight. And crypto means cryptography. And I should have worn that uh, t-shirt. <laughs> But at the same time, I have to say, blockchains are a really, really exciting area. They're a fantastic application of cryptography. So maybe we can even use the word blockchain instead of uh, cryptocurrencies to be clear about what we're, what, what we're discussing. And I do want to say that every, in fact, we did start a new center for blockchain research. And I'm really excited about the science behind, uh, behind blockchains. For researchers in cryptography like me, uh, literally every project that I talk to, I walk away with three new research problems to work on. So the, there's a lot of uh, questions that uh, these projects bring out that have never been asked before. And so this is really an exciting time to work on cryptography, both for protecting information and also for uh, their op its application on blockchain. All right, well, we'll dig into blockchain as we go, as we yeah. go through this. But you were mentioning to me just before, uh, just with the last talk, which was about education and the previous one about usable yeah. security, that you're seeing in your undergraduates a great interest in security education. So can you talk oh, a little man, bit about yes, that? Oh, man, yes, of course. So let's see. So if I have to ask you, what is the most popular area in computer science for our undergraduates? Let's see. I imagine you all know the answers. We can say it all together. I'll, I'll just say it. It's actually machine learning, right? Machine learning is actually the most popular area. But security is actually the, most, the second most popular area among our undergraduate students. So our security courses, our crypto courses, they're very, very well uh, packed. Um, as I said, second most uh, 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 popular area among undergrads. Well justified, lots of jobs that are open in the industry. So I'm, I'm, we're, you know, we're, edu we're graduating students in the area as quickly as we can, and I hope you know all of you guys are hiring them. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Well, that's, that's 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 reassuring to know because it only seems to get more and more important to have everything be secure as we go forward. Right. All right, just to dig into some areas which you're actually doing work on. So I was interested in this idea of. Um, aggregation of information, how you deal with information in a secure way. I think it's called PRIO, right? So yeah, yeah, tell me actually, about this. Yeah, so that's actually a, that's a really a fascinating to topic to talk about. So, uh, so cryptography, as, I, as we said, is kind of the science of protecting information, right? So how do we uh, uh, protect information? But that, it goes way beyond just encryption, which is what the public typically uh, thinks of. And I want to give you one example of how we use cryptography to do much more than just encrypt data. Uh, and that has to do with aggregating information, yeah, aggregating data. So what happened was there are a lot of companies who are interested in pretty much the same problem, which is the following. They put their products out there, and then they want to understand how their customers, their users, use those products. So today, the way that's often done is you send telemetry back from the product to headquarters, and then you build statistics based on that telemetry. Um, so this comes up again and again and again in many different verticals. So cars, for example, car manufacturers want to know how the customers use their cars. You know, what, what features of the radio did they use? Did they use the, uh, you know, the, electronic, the electric uh, um, you know, windshields, uh, uh, the, the windows, and so on? So what features did they use? How did they drive the cars? Uh, all that information can be collected from a modern collected car and uh, be used for statistics. Uh, cell phones want to know, cell phone vendors want to know how, com how c customers use their cell phone. Browser vendors want to know how, brow how their customers use the browsers and so on. Again, all that information can be collected by telemetry, but of course there's a huge privacy, it's, it's kind of, this is a good follow-up to the previous panel, there's a huge privacy uh, issue here with collecting information um, about customer's use. So for example, just to give you one example, suppose you wanted to know um, you know, you're a web browser and you wanted to know, uh, or maybe you're a cell phone provider and you want to know how many of your cell phones in the field are infected with particular malware. Yeah, so t 
Today, what you would do is you would have basically the phones report back whether they're infected or not, and you would kind of aggregate that information over all the data that you got from the different customers. The problem with that is all you were interested in is how many people are infected. You weren't interested in who is infected, yeah? And by collecting telemetry kind of in a naive way, you learn more than you, need, than, than you wanted to learn. And of course, you know, the best way to not uh, uh, lose your customers' data is to not collect it in the first place. This is kind of a good uh, you know, mantra to live by. You know, if you don't, the best way to not lose the data is not to collect it. So the question is, how do we aggregate information from our customers without actually collecting that information? Yeah, so how do we learn statistics about data without learning the underlying data? And that's actually an area where cryptography can help a lot. Yeah, so, so there's a system uh, that, uh, this is one example of such a system that we built um, called Creo. What it does is essentially exa exactly that. You can kind of figure out you know, how many people are infected with a particular malware, how many people have their homepage set to google.com, how many people are currently on the Bay Bridge. Yeah, all that information you can collect uh, in aggregate form without learning anything about the underlying data. Yeah, so that's what uh, the system allows you to do. And I have to say, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, this is actually getting deployed now. There's a, there, there's a, you, you'll be hearing soon, there's, as I said, there's a lot of interest in this from many, ver many different verticals. So the Prio is actually uh, starting to get used now, which is kind of cool. Um, the interesting thing to, to, to say, though, is the way Prio works is it collects information in basically in, in secret, sh secret uh, shared form. So you can think of it as, as though um, I, the, you know, the user sends the information to the cloud, but the cloud doesn't really get to see the information in the clear. Nevertheless, it's able to aggregate the information from all the customers, and once everybody's contributed their data, the data becomes, the aggregate data becomes available. Now, there's an immediate interesting problem that comes up, which is, since I can't see your individual contribution, who's to say that you're not sending me junk data? Like, that's way out of bounds. So for example, if I wanted to, if I'm a, I don't know, I'm a maps provider, I, want, I wanted to know how many people are currently on the Bay Bridge, well, if you're about to go on the Bay Bridge, you have a huge incentive to report an unusually large number just from your own car, say, or from your own phone, so that the system thinks that there is a huge number of cars on the Bay Bridge, and they'll route every, everywhere, everyone everywhere else, and you'll get a free, uh, you know, an empty run through the Bay Bridge, yeah? So, uh, so it's kind of important to make sure that the data that people contribute uh, is in fact in the right range and satisfy whatever predicate for validity that needs to be satisfied, yeah? So you're not, people are not contributing junk data just to throw off the computation. And actually, so how do we do that? The, you know, the cloud provider doesn't get to see the data in the clear, and yet it needs to make sure the data is within range. Yeah, so this is exactly where this beautiful application of cryptography comes in. This is what's called, this is an area called uh, zero knowledge proofs where you can actually very um, efficiently convince the cloud provider that you're sending valid data without telling the cloud provider what the data is. Yeah, it's kind of a magical uh, aspect of, 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 of cryptography. It's kind of something that I think everybody should be aware that it's possible. It's actually possible to send you data without you knowing what the data is, and yet they can convince you that the data satisfies certain properties, yeah? So if it's just w whether I'm on the Bay Bridge or not, I can convince you that I sent you, say, an encryption of zero or one without telling you whether it's a zero or a one, yeah? And then once th the service is, is convinced that the data has integrity, it has validity, it can aggregate it in private form, and once everyone has sent their data, the data becomes available, the aggregate data becomes available in the clear. Yeah, so the system that does this uh, is called Prio, the, the property that uh, it's robust against malicious contributions, well, it's called robustness. And uh, yeah, it's very scalable, very efficient, and as I said, it's actually getting deployed uh, so quite widely. I've always been fascinated by zero knowledge proofs because they are one of those moments where you think about them and you go, how is that possible to yeah. do this thing? And the example I've always seen is there are zero knowledge password systems where you can prove to a system that you know a password without revealing anything about the password, even if the other end was malicious. So if the other, if the other end was taken over by someone else, you haven't given anything away. And that, that seems like, how does how is that possible? Uh, how does that, okay, well, I'm happy to explain how, does that, how that works, but now we're going to have to go to a okay, well, then, board then let's, let's talk about something some, else. Some equations. Although this, what you said is actually really a really good point in that it is important to understand, also with password management systems, today when you log into a website, you send the website your password, right? Well, what right. if it's the wrong website, which is what we call a phishing attack, yeah. and you send the password to the wrong uh, website? Well, there are good authentication systems that I can just prove knowledge of the password without actually sending the password to the other side, as you said. 
Yeah. yeah. And yeah. now, even if I'm at a phishing site, the other side will get nothing yeah. from from that uh, from that interaction. So, you know, cryptography. You have to understand, it's not just about encrypting data. Cryptography does a whole bunch of things for us, uh, and it's a remarkable tool to put to use. And I'm actually really happy to see it actually getting more and more use. And to be honest, this is why I'm kind of excited about these blockchain projects, because they are really at the cutting edge of what cryptography can provide. And they're even asking questions that we, as a research community, never considered before. So you know, they're coming to us and saying, can we do this x, y, and z? And we go, yeah, that's actually a pretty good question. And then we go and work on that. So for us, it's so a wonderful research area. I'm going to keep stopping area. you talking about blockchain yes, until yes, the yes. end. Yes. I, but I want to talk about it, because I want to talk about one other thing, which is SGX. Ah, yes, yes, for so, sure. So uh, you know, in the news today, there's a scary news story about hardware attack in the supply chain with chips being added to motherboards. And SGX is a hardware component. Yes. So take us through what SGX is, and also you're interested in the security of it. Area. Yeah, yeah. So actually, this is, uh, again, something that I, I think that everybody needs to know about. So um, can we do a quick show of hands? I'm really curious. Go, go, go. Can we do a quick do show? It, do it, do it. Yeah, How many yeah, of you yeah. have heard of Intel SGX? Oh, very few. OK, so let me do a quick recap of Intel SGX. I think this is something that everybody needs to know about. So what it is is basically it's not a hardware component. It's something that, that is part of the main processor on your system. And in fact, if you bought a machine in the last couple of years, you already have Intel SGX built in. Um, what it is is a technology that allows you to kind of uh, create what's called a hardware enclave. So it allows you to run code on your main processor in a way that the code and the data that the code acts on are isolated from the rest of the system. Okay, So literally, you can have. Uh, in, your, in your processor, you can kind of cut off part of the processor and have it run uh, a job that no one can see from the outside, can see what it's doing. Not even your operating system. So not even malicious entities who are on your main processor, even they cannot look into the enclave, at least in theory. Yeah? So that's what Intel SGX allows you to do. I think that um, there have you, actually been... Just to interrupt you, what do you do with that? Does yeah, that I'm going to explain that in just a second. Okay, yeah, great. That's, great. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm going to explain. Uh, so there have been uh, recent attacks on the hardware enclave, but uh, the, uh, the, so Intel SGX right now is not, is not as secure as we would like. But you know, we hope that over time, it actually will become better. And uh, there are actually many hardware enclaves architectures out there. Intel SGX is just one example that's uh, shipping widely. But there are many others that are available. So what do we do with it? So, well, so let me talk about ap an application of it in the cloud. And let me talk about application of it on your end user machine. So in the cloud, you can imagine um, one thing people worry about is if I, send, if I outsource all my um, computing resources to the cloud, including all my data, then perhaps you know, a corrupt administrator could somehow get a hold of that data and do something with it. Um, you know, basically, we're trusting the, the cloud to keep our data and our, and our code um, you know, intact. Well, with, with hardware enclaves, you, you, you can reduce the trust in the cloud because all your, basically your code will run inside of the hardware enclave. The hardware enclave will have a secret key built into it so that only inside of the enclave the data will be available in the clear. Outside the enclave, everything will be encrypted. So now even if someone tries, someone in the cloud tries to uh, exfiltrate your data in some way, all they see is ciphertext. The only place where data lives in the clear is inside of the enclave where no one can see it. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a typical application for enclaves in the cloud. We're not there yet. Yeah, we're very far away, actually, from making this a reality. But that's kind of the long-term vision. On the end user, uh, on the end user side, I want to describe something that we, uh, we did recently, which I, I think is kind of uh, useful and something that, um, well, something that I wanted all the time. Yeah, so the problem that always kind of uh, was really frustrating to me was every time I log into a remote system and I type in my password, or you know, maybe I type in my social security number, or my bank account number, or my credit card, or my tax information, that information that I type in into my laptop, you know, I never know. I mean, maybe there's a keylogger on my laptop, and it's recording everything I type in and sending it to who knows where. Right? I just can't tell if there's a keylogger on my laptop, because who knows? Maybe the operating system got compromised, and I, I can't even trust my own, my own operating system to tell me what's, uh, what's running on the machine. So what I, what I really wanted was a way for me to have like guarantees that whatever I type on my laptop is not visible to malware on my laptop, no matter how deeply the malware is embedded on my system. So only the remote website can see what I type in. Anything on my system cannot. Yeah. Well, so hardware enclaves are actually like a perfect match for this type of problem. And the way the system works, it's called Fidelius, by the way. That's if for, for your Harry Potter fans. I hope you recognize what Fidelius is. Uh, but anyhow, so the system, what it does 
is the following. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, again, it's not quite ready for deployment, but let me explain how it works. Um, essentially, everything that I type on my keyboard uh, uh, goes through a little encryption, en encry encryption engine in the keyboard, inside the keyboard. Yeah? So literally every click gets encrypted on the way to the, to the, uh, to, you know, to the main processor. The way we do that is basically, is, you know, the way we, we hack hardware these days is we, using, we use Raspberry Pis. So keyboard is connected to a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is connected to the main machine. So literally everything that I click gets encrypted at the Raspberry Pi on its way to the machine. All right? So fine. So now we have uh, my clicks basically are all encrypted. The question is who can decrypt that, uh, that information? And the answer is, well, you guessed it. Basically, you can decrypt only inside of the hardware enclave. Okay, so as I type, Basically, nothing on the system can see what I'm typing other than the code running inside of the hardware enclave. Okay, fine, so we're not done yet. That's step number one. Step number two is how do I see on the screen what I just typed, right? So if the hardware enclave sent the clicks, the, you know, my key, my, my, the keys that I entered, if it sent it to the graphics card in the clear, well, malware could just intercept it and steal it. So we need to have a trusted path from the hardware enclave onto the screen. And here we, need, we used another Raspberry Pi, which, where what it does is it basically has uh, two HDMI streams going to the display. One HDMI stream coming from the main graphics card, and one HDMI stream coming from the actual hardware enclave. Yeah, so the real website is rendered by the main processor, and that appears in the main HDMI stream. And then whatever I type in is sort of rendered by the hardware enclave, and that's sent in a separate encrypted HDMI stream to the Raspberry Pi, so now there are two. HDMI streams, one is plain text, one is encrypted, going to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi decrypts the encrypted stream, overlays it on top of the regular HDMI stream, and then there's one HDMI cable going to the display. And so you can see, because it's an overlay, you can see the keys that, that, that I just typed on the screen, so I can tell exactly what I, what I actually just entered. But the amazing thing is, um, if you run like screen capture on the system, Basically, the screen capture just sees an empty field. Like, I, I type and type and type, and I see it appearing on the, on the display, but you look at what the system thinks is on the screen, and it just sees empty, yeah, empty, uh, uh, empty data. So this is a way for me, basically, to type. I can see what I type, but nothing on the system actually is seeing what I'm typing other than the hardware enclave. And then the hardware enclave, in addition, also takes what I type and prepares it as an HTTP request to the remote website, so it's encrypted, again, under, under the remote website's public key, so that only the remote website can see the data that I just typed. So these components, eventually, I hope the, the keyboard Raspberry Pi will get embedded into the keyboard. The display Raspberry Pi will get embedded into the display. Yeah, so you would just buy these secure keyboard and secure displays. And now, actually, you're guaranteed. When you're typing on your keyboard in the secure mode, you have to make sure you're in secure mode, um, then nothing on the system sees what you're typing other than the remote website and the hardware enclave, which is isolated from everything else. So to me, this gives me kind of peace of mind. Yeah. Now I, I would feel much more comfortable, say, doing my tax return on my computer, knowing that nothing on my computer can actually steal what I'm typing. Fascinating. That's so, absolutely so that's a kind of an interesting application for hardware enclaves. But I say, like, like I said, there are many, many, many others. And it's quite promising technology. All right, I'm going to unleash your blockchain knowledge. Ah, yes. So tell me about the Center for Blockchain Research ah, okay. in five minutes. Five minutes. OK, that's a, <laughs> quite a task. Get go. All right, let's see. Um, all right, <clears throat> so blockchains, yes. So maybe you've noticed, but blockchains is an area that's just a little bit overhyped. Tiny, tiny bit overhyped, yes? Um, I, I actually think that all the hype around it is causing damage to the field because it's turning away some people. But uh, when you ignore the hype, there's really interesting science happening in the world of blockchains. Really, really fascinating uh, questions. And when you start to look at like, what areas of technology and beyond do blockchains affect, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, so blockchains impact distributed systems. They impact programming languages. We need new programming languages for writing these smart contracts. If you write bugs into your smart contracts, you know, it's not someone, some, someone's computer crashing. It's $50 million getting locked up, and no one can get, can, can get access to that money. So there's real huge amounts of money at stake as a result of these bugs. We need new verification tools to make sure that this code actually is correct and implementing things as we expect. 
We need new cryptography, which is what, what I'm excited about. We need new game theory, new mechanism designs for correctly distributing incentives in blockchains. Uh, and that actually impacts economics. In fact, economists are quite fascinated by uh, what blockchain uh, enables in terms of currencies and such. And then there's a huge aspect, uh, legal aspect, to uh, cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens. In fact, um, cryptocurrencies and crypto assets have become like a, a pretty large sub-discipline of the law now. Uh, and there are many academics and, in fact, uh, legal professionals working, working in this area. So when you think about this, I don't remember in the last, you know, many, many years, like one technology that impacted sort of all of computer science, economics, and law to the level that blockchain is, is, is impacting. Yeah, so there's re really massive, massive um, uh, uh, ideas that are being generated here that are impacting many different fields of technology. Uh, and, you know, there's a need for research. Yeah? This, these, these, these are like fundamental questions that have never been asked before. Um, and so we realized that, that, you know, obviously researchers across the campus were waking up to these problems, and there was a lot of um, activity around blockchains, and our Center for Blockchain Research kind of uh, brings it all together under one umbrella. So we run, so please come, we run a lot of events uh, on campus for, uh, for blockchain, um, uh, people in the blockchain space. So uh, if you're interested, uh, go to uh, CBR, Center for Blockchain Research, cbr.stanford.edu. You'll see there are a lot of events that we run. Please join their events. In fact, in January, there's a conference that we're running um, on new technology, new developments in blockchains. It's open to everyone. Everything we do is, for, is free, open to the public. So, you know, please come. If you want to speak, you know, submit proposals. Uh, so it's really quite an exciting, uh, quite an exciting area. And, you know, uh, new developments happen every time, every, every day. I can tell you we're teaching a, a course on blockchains. This is the third time we're teaching this course. It's very popular this, this time around, as you can imagine. Uh, so we have almost 250 students, a uh, very large number. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the number every year, this is the third year we're teaching it, the number of students who register for the course is correlated directly with the price of Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah? Uh, so I'm hoping that it goes up, and then next year we'll have 500 students. Yeah, so that's my, I, I just want to, I want more students. That's my interest. Is it directly correlated? So if I could get people to go to Stanford, I could affect the Bitcoin price? Ah. Or is it, is it one way? Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, the causal, causality, causality okay. goes the other way, I think, okay, oh, unfortunately. It's a pity, I can't Yeah, so then uh, within the space, should I say more, or do you want keep to Keep going, keep going, keep, uh, okay, going, keep okay. going, keep going. So within the space of blockchain, as I said, I'm, I'm really excited about the area of, of crypto research that's motivated by blockchain, just because of all the new questions they're asking. Um, so let me give you just one example of something that we did, that we did recently. Yeah? So uh, that, um, that has to do with, again, with privacy, privacy on the blockchain. So I don't know how many of you actually know how cryptocurrencies work, but I'll, let me just tell you that the Bitcoin currency, which is the largest one out there, uh, works basically by saying, uh, you know, every time I want to pay someone, I basically, I have an address, the pay, payee has an address, and I write to the blockchain the fact that, you know, Dan is paying... John, five Bitcoins, say. Yeah, and that transaction gets recorded on the blockchain. Um, fine. So if you think about that, you realize, wait a minute, there's some, something funny here. So the whole world, the blockchain is public. It's replicated all over the world. It's public. So the whole world actually gets to see that I just paid John five Bitcoins. Well, I'm not sure that's something that I want the whole world to see. In particular, if Stanford, say, wanted to pay my salary in Bitcoin, the whole world would see what my salary is, right? Or if you are uh, a vendor who's buying uh, you know, equipment from a supplier, when you have supply chain, and you pay in Bitcoins, the whole world would see how much you're paying your supplier. This is sort of fundamentally in conflict with business needs. So the question is, could we add privacy to the blockchain? And there are many, this is again, fascinating, fascinating area. Could we do um, cryptocurrencies with privacy? So there are actually cryptocurrencies that kind of provide complete privacy. Things like Zcash and Monero, if you've heard of those. Um, there you can't tell who's paying who and what amounts. So completely private system. We were interested in a way, in a system that's kind of um, goes halfway and only hides the amounts. So everybody will know that Stanford pays my salary. Everybody knows I work at Stanford. But they shouldn't know what the amount is. They shouldn't know what, what the salary is. Okay? So the way we do it is effectively the value that gets written on the blockchain, the transaction on the blockchain says Stanford pays Dan Bonet. But the amount is, in some sense, encrypted. Technically, we use what's called a cryptographic commitment. But the, technically, we can think of it as, a, as an encryption. So the amount actually is encrypted. OK? Fine. So now we have all these transactions encrypted with encrypted amounts on the blockchain. Well, the interesting thing is, 
the fundamental problem with, uh, the fundamental guarantee of, uh, of what Bitcoin does is it guarantees every transaction is valid. One of the things where validity, that validity means is that the sum of the money coming into the transaction has to be at least as big as the sum of the money coming out of the transaction. So money can't be created out of thin air. And everybody has to be able to verify that publicly. That's kind of the public verifiability of the blockchain. Now I just told you all the amounts are encrypted. So how do you verify that no money is created, that the sum of the inputs is greater, than the sum, greater or equal to the sum of the outputs? How do you do that? Can anyone think? So we have encrypted data that we need to pr prove properties of it. How do we do it? You tell me. Zero knowledge, yeah. exactly. So that's another wonderful application of zero knowledge. And just to show you why this is a new area, the challenge here is data, putting data on the blockchain is extremely expensive because it's replicated all over the world. And it's data per transaction. So we want to minimize the amount of data on, on the blockchain. So the question is, what is the, e what is the shortest possible zero knowledge proof that will allow us to prove that the transaction is valid? So we're looking for short zero knowledge proofs. Yeah? And so we designed a system called Bulletproofs that actually gives um, uh, the shortest zero knowledge proof, proof that we have without trusted setup. Uh, and actually, you know, that actually is, is something that's getting adopted. Again, this is why I love the space. You kind of invent something and you know, projects actually go and adopt and deploy it. Um, so I don't know. So this is just, okay, just so to let's, give you one example. Let's do this. We're very close to ah. lunch. Let's let uh, the audience ask a question if there's a question. Let's see. Let's go all the way back over here. And ask. Can you talk a little bit about a little bit about uh, homomorphic, actually maybe multi-part computing, Shamir, secret sharing, kind of the applications for that? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, I think you started with, with uh, homomorphic encryption. Yeah, so, oh man, so you're asking me in one minute to talk about homomorphic encryption. Okay, well, I'll say it in 30 <laughs> seconds maybe. So, homomorphic, so fully homomorphic encryption is basically a development, um, uh, actually by one of my former students uh, from a few years ago, that basically allows you to compute unencrypted, unencrypted data. Yeah, so even though the data is encrypted, you can still <laughs> compute on that data. So I can issue, so the, I don't know, the, 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 there are many applications uh, for that technology, um, but maybe instead of giving applications, I'll, I'll just give a caveat in that fully homomorphic encryption, we know how to do it now in polynomial time, but unfortunately, in practice, it's still a little bit too slow to actually deploy in the real mm -hmm. world. So it's technology that's coming. Hopefully, well, you know, crypto systems can only get better. They can't get worse. Uh, so, oh, well, I guess, unless they're broken. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Apart from as, that. Yeah. Other than that, they only get better. So hopefully, we'll have better and better homomorphic encryption at some point that can actually be used in practice. So I'll leave it at that. OK. We're seconds away from lunch. So I'm going to stop and not have ah, another question. Okay. But so two things. So lunch is on the roof and in the basement. So you can choose whether you want to be in the dark or in the sun <laughs> to eat. See what we're doing. Um, We'll be back here at 1 o'clock. I'll actually be back here at 1 o'clock with Sophie Wilson, who was the designer, one of the designers of the first ARM chip. And every single person in this room has multiple ARM chips. All those places. You were using Raspberry Pis, which are an ARM core. So she's going to talk about the genesis of ARM and how that was created. So that's at that's 1 PM back here. And then I'll be done for the day <laughs> and get to have a rest. But Go have lunch. Dan, this was fascinating. We could have gone on for an hour, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. We should have had a whiteboard. <laughs> but, so thank you very much for joining us. Yeah.